participants they will lose their next year to uncle start doing it Seven thirty seven. Now it's exactly 7.35. Since we are having a technical problem, we could not start in time. We are really sorry for that. Anyway, a very good evening to our respected resource person and to all the participants who are joining us through different platforms, Zoom and YouTube Live. I am Dr. Kailan Hingsangi and I'll be your host for tonight. As we have come to the last night of one week international webinar on religion and politics in Mizoram, negotiating the charge secular dichotomy. I once again extend a warm welcome on behalf of Government Sertip College. Before we further proceed, there is a brief important announcement for all the participants. Uh, number one, the feedback form will be sent directly to your registered email and it will also be put in the chat box after the speaker's speech. So I kindly request you all to fill up the feedback form. Number two, if you have any questions regarding the talk, you can drop your questions in the Q&A option which is down below your screen. So moving on to the program, tonight we feel very privileged to have Professor Jankongam Dongkel in our midst who will be speaking on the topic Negotiating Charge State Dichotomy Uniqueness of the Role of the Charge in Mizoram. As we all know, uh, we have already heard an informative talk from Professor Dongel from the first night of our webinar. So I don't think I need to have an elaborate introduction, but rather I would love to highlight a bit of his work of introduction. Uh, Professor Jang Kongam Dongkel is currently professor in Department of Political Science, Mizoram University, and he is a director in Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQSC, Mizoram University. He started his teaching career since 1996. His area of specialization is Autonomous District Council, six schedule for, to the Constitution of India, local government and Northeast studies. He has also contributed a number of articles in English, Mizo, Thadao Kuki, in reputed newspaper in Mizoram and Manipur. He is selected for the Fulbright Nehu Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship 2022-2021 and he got affiliation in Department of Political Science, University of Cincinnati, Ohio State, United States of America. He presented 70 papers in nation, international, national, regional, and state level se seminar across the country. The list can go on. So with that, let me end the introduction. So sir, if you're ready, uh, the session is yours. Please, sir. Okay, so <clears throat> tonight, uh, the topic which is to be deliberated is 
negotiating charge state dichotomy, uniqueness of the role of the charge in Mizoram. And I may not take even one hour tonight because it will be a focused lecture now, unlike the uh, introductory night. In the, intro, in, in, in the introductory night, there are a lot to touch and a lot to focus. That's why uh, we took a little bit of time, but tonight uh, uh, I may not take, take long time. We'll better spend time in interaction. That's what I'm uh, planning. Okay, now we can move on to the next slide. So, uh, dichotomy. So dichotomy in literary term has been defined by Oxford Dictionary as the separation that exists between two uh, objects or two things which are completely opposite and different from each other. So that is the definition of dichotomy. And this term has been used to describe the relationship between two unavoidable features of human society. That is religion and state. In our context, charge and state. We cannot avoid either charge or state. Both are necessary for us and both are inalienable to us because it is important part of our life. Our life has been saved both by charge and state. Okay, the next slide. So if these two dichotomies, dichotomy structures are balancedly negotiated, balancedly managed, and balancedly solved, then there will be peace and tranquility in society. But any imbalance negotiation of the two dichotomy will lead to social unrest, social problem, and law and order problem. That's why balanced negotiation of these two dichotomy is really needed to maintain peaceful society. And as we know, Christianity affected necessary changes in the Roman Empire in the first three century AD. And because of that, dichotomy, these two dichotomy came up. And as these two, di this dichotomy arise, what is necessary to negotiate between the two dichotomy. So without, as I've mentioned, without proper negotiation or balanced negotiation of the two dichotomy, there will be social unrest, there will be social problem, then peace and tranquility will not be maintained in the society. Okay, the next slide. So this charge state dichotomy also emerges as significant discourse in political system, particularly in Mizoram political system also, this dichotomy, deliberation on this dichotomy is still going on. And so far as Mizoram context is concerned, despite this discourse on charge state dichotomy, charge has unique role in Mizoram. So the unique role of the charge should not be forgotten. That's why unique role of the charge and state dichotomy will be evaluated in this deliberation. The emergence of Christianity in the first three centuries AD affected changes in relationship between religion and state, which came to be known as charge and state. So in Western country, mostly in Europe and America. So instead of mentioning or describing it as religion and state, it is commonly described as charge and state. And that term is also relevant in the context of Mizoram. And Christianity expanded and Christian population rapidly increased despite persecution by the state authority after um, many centuries after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, as we know. So 
for for two many centuries christian people were persecuted they were discriminated and many were martyred also but roman emperor constantine he declared christianity as a straight religion in 324 AD. So with the declaration of Christianity as state religion, new development took place. And after that, Christianity became stable. Then, so with the where establishment of this Christianity, there was interference of charge in politics and then state also began to interfere in Charles affairs. Then Charles state dichotomy became very, very relevant and prominent in political thought. That's why in the writing of most of the political thinkers, they touch upon this Charles state dichotomy. That's why in many instances, imperial interfere too much in spiritual affairs. Then on the other hand, Pope also interfere in temporal affairs. So such was the condition. Then this charge state relationship was propounded by political thinkers in different periods. So in different periods of uh, in different periods, these political thinkers they propounded uh, that's important part of the charged dichotomy. So mention can be made of Saint Ambrose. So Saint Ambrose, he was year three hundred forty to three hundred ninety seven AD, and Saint Ambrose advocated in independence of Charles from the state. That Charles should not be under control of the state. Then after that, St. Augustine, he propounded theory of two cities. What are those two cities? City of God and Ardi city. City of God means that kingdom which was occupied by Christian believers. Then kingdom or country occupied by non-Christian believer, non-Christian that is Adli city. So in such way he classified. Then Pope Galatius the first, he propounded theory of two sorts. So in this theory of two sorts, he advocated that God divided power between imperial and Pope. Imperial in charge of political matters and Pope in charge of spiritual matters. Then Saint Thomas Aquinas, he advocated that state was created by God to punish evil doers only. So they were Christian philosophers, uh, Christian thinkers. Okay, the next, next slide. Hmm. Then Marsilius of Padua, he expounded two types of law. Then what are the two types of law? Divine law and human law. Law from God, then law, law from for human being. That's what I... And after that, Reformation thinkers also propounded some thoughts of political theory concerning this church state relationship. And mention can be made of the prominent Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he advocated doctrine of two regimens. That means, what he means to focus is, was that church or religion, church should be obedience to secular authority. Charles should not be authority, but Charles should be under the governance of secular authority. Then Milek Stone is stated that state is the creation of God. So state is created by God. That's why state should be ruled as per the will of God. Okay, the next slide. Then John Calvin, he stated that state was ordained by God. That's why as state was ordained by God, state should function according to the will of God. Then what Machiavelli, Niccolo Machiavelli said? 
Niccolo Machiavelli statement was just the opposite. That means he separated politics and state to the extreme. Politics and state, have, uh, no, politics and religion has no relationship. So state and politics, uh, church and state should be totally separated. That was the view of Machiavelli. That's why, so as I've mentioned, sometimes Pope interfere in political matters then sometimes uh, the imperial interfere in spiritual matters. And due to that, sometimes conflict broke up between the Pope, the church leader and the imperial. That's why there was conflict between Pope Gregory VII and Henry IV. Then conflict between Pope and King of England also led to the emergence of Anglican Sarsin. England. So in such a way, uh, in many countries, these developed into some type of political crisis. Okay, next slide. That's why due to all these development from the medieval period, starting from the medieval period, Charles state dichotomy began to be important issue of discourse up to modern political philosophy. So as a result of this Charles state dichotomy, concept of secularism emerged. So in order to maintain balance between these Charles and state, the dichotomy, Charles state dichotomy, so concept of secularism emerged and will not spend much time on secularism. In the earlier lecture, I mentioned about different concepts of secularism. So, and in many country, they, through the concept of secularism, church and state are required to be restricted. That means should be restricted to its sphere. So like the responsibility of church should be restricted to spiritual affairs and state to temporal or political affairs. Why? Because particularly in many Christian country and Christian states, both the head of state and head of church, they are on the church members. That's why this balance seems to be necessary and this balance has been advocated in, uh, by the political thinkers and political philosophers. So, negotiation between dichotomy structure. It is necessary and it is required for a amicable relationship. And Western countries, Western countries like countries of Europe and America, they emphasize this dichotomy with the concept of freedom of religion. States should be separated from religion. Church should be separated from religion. So everyone should have freedom. There should be no restriction. So freedom of religion. There is the expression of the secular characteristic from the development of dichotomy in Western countries. But what is the concept of secularism and how secularism has been expressed in the constitution of India? In the constitution of India, the dichotomy structure or secularism is not interpreted as freedom of religion, but equal treatment of all religions. So 
equal treatment of all religion is the concept of secularism and the interpretation of secularism in the constitution of India. Okay, we come to the third point, Charles the dichotomy in Mizoram context. So Mizoram completed 100 years of Christianity on 11 January 1994. And as we know, there was also centenary celebration observed in the same year. And so many people describe as Mizoram's, Mizoram as a Christian majority state. We cannot say the Christian state, Christian majority state, because 87 percent of the population as per 2011 census comprise the Christian population. Then who are the remaining 13 percent really population who, who constitute different religious group, other religious group like Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and some other religion. They constitute 13 percent of the population. So, so far as the Zo ethnic group is concerned, Zo ethnic different Zo ethnic tribes from within and outside Mizoram is now same person Christian. And because of that, this Charles state dichotomy discourse is more and more relevant. And that's why, what is the Charles state dichotomy? discourse in different period that we have to assay and that we have to look at it. Like the discourse of church state dichotomy in pre-independent era, district council era, district council era starting from independence up to 1972. The union territory from 1972 uh, the declaration of statehood and statehood from 1987. So in every period, this dichotomy was balanced. So in pre-independent era, British administrators and missionaries, they cooperated where they worked together where, but problem crop up due to extreme campaign of abolition of boy system by the professor Christian missionary, uh, medical missionary, which led to his expulsion from, expulsion from Lusa Hills in 1921. So the administration was not in favor of abolition of boy system. Because of his extreme campaign, he was expelled from Lusa Hills in 1911. Other than that, there was no such dichotomic problem in pre-independent era. Then in this district council era, with the celebration of chapter code organized from 1960 to 63, then some controversy crop up. And as a result of that, the church, the church leaders were, were not in favor of continuing these Chapterkut celebration. Because in the Chapterkut celebration, a bottle of wine was shown, display. And due to the due to plea of the chairs, Chapterkut celebration was discontinued by Mizo District Council from 1965. Then in U, the chairs focused its attention on peace initiative, how to bring MNF leaders, MNF and government of India to the negotiating table. So that was the concerns of the, the concern of the Charles and Charles leader during UT era. Then during statehood era, Charles state dichotomy discourse was mainly, we all know it, on the issue of Jew, on the issue of liquor. But though Issues were there. This charge state dichotomy has been negotiated well and it has it was solved and it was also 
negotiated in different period. Okay, we'll come to the fourth point. Unique, uniqueness of the role of charts in Mizoram. So, as per the provision of fundamental rights in part three of the constitution of India, there are no state religion in India and no religion can be declared as state religion. That is not allowed by the constitution. So we find clearly there in the constitution provision from article 25 up to article 30 of the constitution of India that is written. And Mizoram being 87% Christian population. As I've mentioned earlier, Charles state dichotomy negotiation is highly required. That's why the role of Charles in Mizoram is unique. Why? Because Charles teaches its members to be obedient to governing authority as found in the biblical teaching in the book of Romans chapter 13, verse one. It is clearly mentioned. So what is mentioned in Romans chapter 13, verse one? Everyone must obey the state authority because no authority exists without God's permission. So the existing authority have been put here by God. So governing authority is the proposal of God only. And in line with this, the church issued circular to its members from time to time, even before the many years before the formation of MPF, church issued election communique to its members to be faithful citizens, to be sincere citizens, to cast vote, and not to do bogus voting and not to practice unfair means. And in this regard, the church also was fully supported by civil societies, YMA and other civil societies. That's why church play significant role in this order. And church also involved in peace initiative. And due to the peace initiative of the church, MNF and government of India could be brought to the negotiating table and which led to the signing of Mizoram Accord in 1986. That's why Charles played many unique roles. And not only that, the Charles in Mizoram is not only a silent spectator, but the Charles is active social reformer also. In what way? The Charles fights against social evils like liquor, drug abuse, corruption, discrimination of poor, poor, and Charles also organized awareness campaigns and seminars for political awareness and social awareness so that the church members, citizens may be aware of their rights, they may be aware of their duties towards the state. And church also propagates biblical teachings. And church cannot accept any steps taken by the government which seems to be unbiblical, which seems to be against the teaching of the Bible. So, in this regard, the charge is very critical. That's why, as I've mentioned, the charge is not only a silent spectator, but also a deep social reformer. And that, the charge fought against MNF government led by Laldenga in on the issue of liquor, on the issue of Jew in 1988. And after that, the same charge fought against Congress government led by Lal Thakola on the East Coast in 2018. That's why the charge did not spare anything which seems to be unbiblical. So the stand of the charge does not mean that charge is against a particular pol political party or charge is in favor of a particular political party. No, it's not. But it fought against any state or anything which seems to be unbiblical. So that is the standpoint of the church. That's why the church played unique role. And now the church in Mizoram also vehemently fight against, fights against yoga because yoga is believed to be based 
on Hindu religion, Hindu philosophy, Hindu religious belief. Due to that, MKHC, MTA, and different church denominations, they are tooth and nail opposed against this imposition of yoga in institution. And another unique feature of the church is that of MPF, election watchdog, and helping the election commission of India, so to say, to conduct free and fair poll. And MPF, so last night, Dr. Siam Kisol talked in detail about the formation of MPF, what led to the formation of MPF, what are its activities, and as we know, MPF has been formed in 2006. But even before the formation of MPS, MPF, many years before the formation of MPF, the Tsars already played general. That's why though some Tsars denomination cannot be part of the movement actively, as we have listened last night, so it is regarded as reform movement spearheaded by the Tsars. So social movements here have headed by the church. That's why uh, way back in 2013, I presented one seminar paper in Allahabad University International Seminar about this role of MPF. Okay, now critical evaluation of church state dichotomy in Mizoram. So as we know, Christian constitute 87% of the population in Mizoram. That's why important machinery of the state is in the hands of the majority religious community. Due to that, church state dichotomy, dichotomy is essential and it requires balanced negotiation and proper negotiation for maintenance of social order, for maintenance of peace and tranquility, and for enforcement of law and order. That's why this is highly required. So if there is imbalance of such state, dichotomy problem usually arise and many problem came up from time to time. Then so far as this church state dichotomy in Mizoram is concerned and the relationship and the working relationship between church and state some critics allege that Mizoram is like a theocratic state. Why? It is theocratic state because government properties like vehicle, building, halls, funds, and other sources are utilized by the different church denomination for church program and conferences. So that is the uh, criticism of the critics, or that is the observation of the critics. So the critics also observed that having done all these things by the church, is it not violation or is it not breach of the provision provided in fundamental rights in part three of the constitution of India? So it's been raised often by many That's why even if government properties are used by different church denomination and different church group, let it be on payment in order that it may contribute at least a little bit amount of revenue for the state. And the critic also criti critics also criticize that church 
interfere too much in policy matter of the government, like opposition to MNF government on liquid issue in 1988 and opposition to Congress government in, on liquid issue in 2018. So in such step also, many critics, they felt that is not Charles crossing its limit, but the church and church leaders clarified that it could not accept any policy, it could not accept any state which has been done not on the basis of biblical teaching. That's why church has the right, church has, has the right to argue, to fight, and to correct the wrong done by anyone. That's why the church clarified that it is its duty to stand for justice. It is its duty to fight for justice. That's why the church feel that any born again Christian should be free from liquor as written in the Bible. So that is the standpoint of the church. But it should however be noted that any ruling party or any party, ruling party, which confront with the church on this liquor issue, whether, whether it be in the past, uh, in the past or at present or at any situation, any political party or ruling party which confronted with the church on this liquor issue seems to be defeated in that election. So this is what it can be observed in Mizoram electoral politics and Mizoram political system. And the church also has been criticized for not excommunicating corrupted members who face penalty due to corruption case, although the church regularly excommunicated drunkards, those who committed adultery, or those who got married without following the church rules. In such a way, the critic alleged that even if there is provision for excommunicating those who are church and those who are punished on corruption page, this has not yet been taken up by the church. That's why even the church constitution and bylaw also properly provided for excommunicating such type of person, but this has not yet taken by any church denomination. So that is another view of critics. And some church denominations, some church groups are critical and also have been given for, for giving importance. Let me use the uh, biblical word, early VIPs, because uh, light if VIPs like chief ministers, ministers, MLS, chief executive member of district council, chairman of district council, executive members of district council, all those are given so much important position in church work, uh, I mean in uh, church program, church related program, conference, maybe assembly or in any church program, other than the spiritual leaders or heavenly leaders, so to say, spiritual VIPs like pastor, missionaries, and church workers. Is it not the church doing what it should not do? So in this regard, many complaints are there. That's why, uh, as it is mentioned, so as I've, say, as I've said, I've used a little bit of biblical word. That means why oddly VIPs are given more 
higher position than the uh, heavenly VIPs in such related program. That's why, is it the right thing to do for any church denomination or church in this regard? So this question also has been raised many a time and it is also mentioned many a time. In such a way, uh, that's why by, by taking state in this regard, is church, is it, is it not polluting the spirituality of the church by according so much status and importance to VIP of the state? So this observation is also there. And it is also said that some church denominations have the practice of inviting some minister, MLA, CM and chairman of district council as observer in church assembly. So in this regard, is it the right thing to be done by church? So many questions have come up. That's why uh, at the time when Jesus Christ was doing his ministry in the world, he also mentioned things which uh, things for Caesar and things for God. Those two things should not be mixed up. That's why, and other than that, like there are important programs in church also, maybe like uh, opening of building or some function or some uh, related program. So in such important church program, is it necessary to invite state VIPs like chief minister, minister, MLA, or from the district council side chairman or CM, instead of inviting those uh, state VIP, is it not better all the minister of God, pastors or reverend can do it? So in this issue also, in this, in this very point also, there are many issues. That's why many questions are arising now. Why? Temporal leaders or political leaders interfere too much in such program. Why they are invited too much in such program. So this is also coming up. That's why is the church doing what it has to do? Then we can know that the president of Tanzania earlier who was a good Christian, he didn't like VIP treatment inside the church. He was usher and he collected offering in church program. That's why VIP treatment should not be accorded to political and state leaders in church program because pastors and church leaders who are the old minister of God, they should occupy important position in church related program. And on the other hand, there are also many questions and deliberation with regard to participation of pastors in active politics. So is it conducive? We know that pastors are expected to be eye openers, awareness creators to the church members, awareness creators in socio-political issue, awareness creator in economic issue to the platform, through church platform. But is it advisable for the pastor to involve in politics, active politics? So many issues came up. There was exception of Reverend Jesse and Nicole Stroy from Hasi Hills. And in Mizoram earlier, we, from UPC, one or then Minister H. Lalrota was elected as MLA, he even became cabinet minister. So with regard to this revenge as M. Nicole Stroy, the situation was different, how he plunged into politics. Reverend as M. Nicole Stroy plunged into politics and contested election, not due to his political, personal political ambition, 
but due to goal of the people. The public called him up. The public called him up, and after the public called him up, he prayed to God many a time, and after that, he contested the election. But even after he was MLA, he continued with his pastoral work. And even after he was inducted as cabinet minister also, he continued with his pastoral work. That's why, why Reverend Zezian Nicholas Floyd plunged into politics, he was called by the people. It was not due to his personal ambition. That's why it may not be appropriate to comment or to recommend or not to recommend the involvement of pastor in active politics. But political, depending upon the political situation, psychological status of the society, and opinion and acceptance of the church member, these things should be taken into consideration. That's why. And on the other hand, state. State should also be careful in, in engaging serving pastor in official position of the state. Because a lot of hue and cry has often been raised when pastors are accommodated in some official position by the state. So many questions came up and many issues also came up in public discourses. So these theologians and pastors, they are trained to be church leaders to, me, to guide the church member in their spiritual life. So is their training for government and politics? This is also often arise. And as we know, the most critical problem between church and state in the context of Mizoram is on the issue of Jew. That it was there earlier in 1988, then after that in 2018. And now the church also has critical view with regard to imposition of this yoga in many government-based institutions. So that's why from different platform, from different denomination, then from MKHC, MTA, and from other platforms also, the jars raise its voice and jars speak against the states taken up by the government. Okay, we'll come to the concluding remark. <clears throat> so, since the evolution of Christianity, Christian religion, church state dichotomy discourse came up. It, it was deliberated by political thinkers in medieval and modern time then it was also deliberated and debate was going on in different circles. Due to that, this church state dichotomy has been given attention in the framing of different constitutions of the world, in almost all the democratic constitution, and even in the Constitution of India also, as we know, the concept of secularism is incorporated. And like other states and other places, church state dichotomy and its negotiation process could also be found in Mizoram in different period like pre-independent era, District Council era, Union Territory era, and Statehood era. That's why, having said that, church dichotomy is in the process. 
the unique role which the Tsars contributed should also not be forgotten in Mizoram context. Tsars in Mizoram has done, has played and still plays unique role which are not found in many states and countries of the world. There are certain critical comments upon church and upon state also in the dichotomy relationship. And there are certain do's and don'ts for both church and state to maintain good relationship. So it is said that church should not interfere too much in temporal affairs. Church should not give too much importance to early VIPs. Pastor Hoki Kovit, Patian Kevinadani, and Antitrinity. So, one, so on Patian Kevinad, Aya Hovel Kevinad, so Dalal Fovison, called an aboy, she and any, Tira, called an Tamzok upon Saint and she and ya. So, one, so on Mani Wongi Oma. So called Wong Oma, called an Wong Oma. Called an Wonga, so called in Rolu to Poha di Glova, called an so called Wonga, called an by in Rolu to Poha at the Glova, more or two. Balance taka for for dun tian yen ai ta. Chu wang chuan entil nan ko ren program poi mo ne ko ren thil ti na poi mo ai mo ko ren na po tian yin shia ka ti te pastor te reverend te anu me la ya ko ren na thil hon tu la mo thil han tu ve la chief minister mo minister mo emele mo tu ai mo te va be se fo po hi he hi ko ren thil Kalpuidan to Renium Tipohi, Zonahi, to Laya, Atamto, Hotmea, Hemi Pohian, State Let Charles, Relationship, Sweehi, Sevenson, Catapo, Chicken Pot, Nason, Nation, 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 should be carefully analyzed, negotiated, and amicably solved so as to enable peace and tranquility in the society and in the political system. That's why right. importance of church and state should be equally at hell, and confrontanies attitude should be avoided by both. Therefore, church state dichotomy should be given importance, and church state dichotomy should be properly negotiated and any problem or crisis should be solved through this negotiation. So if the church and state can negotiate properly, can cooperate properly, and if this dichotomy is maintained, negotiated, and managed well, then the, there will be no social problem, then there will be no law and order problem also. But as I've said, in this church state dichotomy, both should know the do's and don'ts. So there are certain things which should not be mixed, that should not be mixed. That's why both should know its boundary, both should not cross its boundary, and both should respect each other. Okay, with this, let me end my speech. And now I'll hand it over to the uh, host. And tonight, some problem with my PPT, that's why PPT has been uh, monitored from the main, that's why sometimes the flow may not be proper. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Very profound and enlightening talk. And then there are a couple of questions which are asked by the participants. So should I start reading from the first question? Okay. Okay, the first one, the first question is, since balanced dichotomy is considered necessary for peace and tranquility, do you mean a person engaged in active politics should keep religious principles aside? If not, how would such dichotomy between the two balance without compromising one's religion's religious principles? 
it's a little bit long. Should I repeat it? Am I making a sense while reading? Uh, it's clear. It's clear. I, I look at the chat box also. Okay. It's fine. Thank you. Mm. See, balanced dichotomy means like uh, both church and state should perform their respective function, but from Christian perspective, not only the church but state also should be governed as per the biblical provision. That's why politician may be a politician. Though he is a politician, he does not mean that he should keep his uh, religious principle aside. That is Mekia believe you. So we are not supporting Mekia believe you. So what Mekia believe say? Everything is justifiable in politics. What type of methods, whether clean or unclean, or even up to blood sun. You can use any method, but if you can achieve your aim, that, that, that is justified. That's why he said, the means justified the ends. The ends justified the means. So to McEvely, any method can be used in politics, clean, unclean, or anything. If that helps you in to be success in to, to be successful in politics, you can use that. But as per the biblical doctrine, it is not. That's why if one is a politician, if one is a minister, so if he's a Christian, what the Bible teaches him, if he's a born-again Christian, what he are do's and don'ts for born-again Christian that he has to do. He should not do like what others do. He should do like what the Bible teaches him. He should do like what the preaching he listens every Sunday in the, in the church. So, balanced dichotomy means these, both these church and state should function, should coordinate, and should work together for the better man, not to create conflict. Okay. Uh, secondly, do you think BJP as a political party and ruling government maintain dichotomy as mentioned in the presentation? Yeah. Uh, see, whether it be BJP, so First, let me mention the ideological division of political parties in India. I think many of us are aware of it. In India, political parties are classified on the basis of ideology in three groups. That means those political parties who are based on religion, religious teaching, and who believe in God and religion. They are called right, righties. And under righties come BJP, Chief Sena, Indian Union Muslim League, then AIUD, and Akali Dar. So those political party who are identified with religion and God, they are in the right. And just opposite to that, there are political party who do not believe in religion and God. They are communists. So those political parties who do not believe in religion and God and who do not subscribe to religion and who follow Marxism, economic equality. So they are described as left. So, so they are the two opposite. One is no to religion, no to God, leftists. One is supportive to religion and God, based on religious teaching also, righties. And between these 
right and left or righties and lefties. There are some political parties in India who do not oppose religion and God like what the BJP and other righties do. And uh, I mean, who do not support religion and God like what BJP and other righties do. And on the other hand, who do not oppose religion and God like what the lefties do. So they are in the media. They are in the media. That's why they are called center, centrist. And those centrist parties in India, they describe themselves as secular party. Because we don't have link with religion. But when opportunity came, those parties also, they link up, they link up with uh, the righties and sometimes with the lefties. Even now, uh, so those righties, those centuries are Indian National Congress, then NCP, uh, then Trinamool Congress, all these, they are grouped under this centrist party. But when we look back at the Indian situation, for example, in the 70s, when Indira Gandhi government was a minority, that Indira government, minority government was supported from outside by leftist communists. Then, after the Zanata Party government was formed in 1990, uh, 1977, all those conflicting ideological groups, they formed government, but it didn't last long. Not, it, it, it did not complete half of the time also. Then what happened in 1989, when National Front government was formed? That National Front was supported by, both by lefties and righties, but that government also did not last long. That's why uh, all the political parties in India, what I mentioned, whether they are lefties, righties, or centrists, all of them, they have linked with some religion or they interfere with it for their political gain. That's why BJP alone cannot be singled out. So such is the situation. That's why uh, light, there is freedom of religion, equal treatment of religion. No religious groups should be given special importance and this and that. But as we know, the condition of BJP. BJP from its initial stage is going hand in hand with the RSS. That's why to some extent, RSS policy and what RSS has propagated that BJP also cannot refuse to some extent. So such is the situation. That's why whatever BJP has done is religion or whatever BJP has done, it is unconstitutional, we cannot say. Yes, I have said, not only BJP, even other political parties also, if the situation permit and it is for the political gain, all have some type of religious environment and religious thinking. Sorry. Next one we have, why the charge is against the so-called yoga? Would you please specify? Uh, yeah, in this regard, <clears throat> as we know, the background, how yoga came up. Some say, some say and justify that ah, it is exercise. Okay, exercise is fine. But by doing some physical exercise, if one pronounce Om or Shiva or what Hindu God, what is the significance? 
that's why uh, for those who want to do and who want to practice if practice within their own sphere that's very good but if it comes in the forms of imposition because it is clear that the practice has been started from Hindu religious belief and practices. That's why if this is imposed upon other minority, minority religion or who reluctantly uh, accept it as he or she has no option. That means uh, it contradicts to the religious freedom of the individuals. That's why, and from the background itself, it is very clear that the background is from Hindu religious belief. That's why the church cannot accept it. So, Mizoram Kaushan Raitu Committee, MKHC, Mizoram Theological Association, then different church denominations, they all oppose it. That's why, as it is believed to be based on Hindu religious practices, this is not welcome by the church and church leaders. Okay. Uh, next we have, do you think the churches have responsibility in the incident of the highest rate in HIV positive case? What is the question? Do you think the charge of responsibility in the incident of the highest rate in HIV positive case? Yeah, in, in this regard, uh, Charles has taken a lot of steps, like from government agency also. Uh, and in different churches, they organize awareness campaign about this HIV AIDS and church members are enlightened through those programs. But and not only that, Besides collaboration with MSET and some other government agency also, many churches also they have uh, their own program and their, their own role in fighting against this HIV AIDS and in launching campaigns and awareness. So, so far as the spread of HIV and AIDS is concerned, different church denomination, they are doing what they can do from their capacity. But we cannot expect from, we cannot expect beyond. That's why uh, the number may increase and it may spread. But so far as the different church denominations are concerned, I think uh, uh, it is a truth that at their own level, they are fighting. At their own level, they are contributing. Okay, our next one we have, when you talk about church, 
do you particularly mean the Presbyterian Church of Mizoram? As we witness that other denomination role in the state politics is minimal. Church, church, I use church as a collective noun. I don't use proper nouns for Presbyterian. That is the answer. Okay. If I use proper noun for Presbyterian, I may use it Presbyterian Church of India Mizoram or Mizoram Presbyterian Church. But I never use that. I use church. So it means all the different church denominations are integrated here. I use it in collective sense. Okay. Next we have thus the notion of church. State separation really applicable in the context of Indian secularism because it is sometimes refers to a concept wherein a state recognizes a particular church or religion for the whole state. What, what is the question? Uh, does the notion of church state separation really applicable in the context of Indian secularism? Because it is sometimes refers to a concept wherein a state recognizes a particular church or religion for the whole state. It's question number two, sir, from OPPO F1. Question number two. Yeah. Okay, I, I see it. Okay. No, Indian secularism does not speak about separation. So we speak clear concept. How secularism is interpreted in the constitution of India? It is very clear. Equal treatment of all religion. Then in Article 27, what is written? Any religious text should not be allowed. Text for better man or benefit of any particular religion should not be elevated. It's not allowed. It is totally this time. Then, when we see other provision of the Constitution also, we found that uh, one has the freedom to profess and practice religion, but that is also with restriction. It is not unlimited freedom. It is not unlimited freedom, and that should also be taken into account. So, in the Constitution of India, in any provision, whether it is in fundamental rights or it is not in, mentioned in the preamble also, in the fundamental rights also it is mentioned. Secularism means equal treatment of religion. But in Western context, secularism means station charge and freedom of religion. That's why in the context of India, I think uh, these wording may not be applicable and like any state religion in, in any state state religion cannot be announced cannot be propagated that is not allowed by the that is for forbidden by the fundamental right like in some state uh, some state uh, some state may be hindu dominated some state may be sikh dominated some state may be muslim dominated so as majority community are dominating, sometimes certain states may be taken by the government to receive them or to help them, but it does not need declaration of state religion. No state in India has the power to declare state religion. Okay. I think that's enough. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, next. How can we just how can we justify divine command ethics? It's more important than secular morality, like the case of zoo. Question number three. Hmm. 
Yeah. So, in this regard, See why the church is against Jew because many bad things about Jew is written in the Bible that we all know, and that's why the church fights against it for to purify the society and not to pollute particularly the church. That's why in fighting against the church, uh, a Jew, the church has done what it has to do. So in case if the church is not speaking out against this Jew or liquor policy. Many members may charge the church because why the church is not doing biblical thing? That issue will come up. And that's why this has been done <coughs> so that uh, Charles administration and Charles process can go on spiritually as per the teaching of the Bible. So that is the main focus. That's why. Okay, next question we have. How can religious... If one. Okay, let's continue. So should I read the next question? How can religious reasons and political decisions be tolerated? Uh, yeah. How religious reasons and political decisions be tolerated? It depends on Charles State Dichotomy Discourse. So if Charles State Dichotomy Discourse is negotiated well, then religious reasons and political decisions will be negotiated then we'll come to the right conclusion. Okay, next one we have, can the charge Is be neutral? Fine? Yes, sir. Next one we have, can the charge be neutral in lobbying towards the state? Question number five. Can the charge be neutral in lobbying towards the state? lobbying the question the question itself is not clear can the church be neutral in lobbying towards the state so when we use the word lobby that means asking something for a particular group asking something for a particular section in the form of pressure group or interest group through this word lobbying interest group came up in the united states of america then why in India we call it pressure group. But uh, maybe the idea of the one who asked the question may be, uh, in case if Charles makes some demand to the state, will the Charles be neutral? I regard it in that way. So like uh, taking we are in uh, the focus is in Mizoram context. So I would like to uh, request other, other participants outside also uh, to understand it. The thing is that if Charles demands something for Mizoram as a whole, generally, for the good of Mizoram, then with fatherly 
the Tsars ask the Tsars make the state aware of it to implement it. Then, in that regard, neutrality is with the Tsars. The Tsars is neutral. Neutral in the sense the Tsars is not supporting a particular party or opposing a particular party. That is the responsibility of the church. That should also be the nature of the church. That's why whatever church it is. Due to that, the church should not have political color. And their political color should also be not none. That's why in this regard also, church is expected to be neutral. Okay, question number six we have. Does the involvement of the church limit democratic authority? Ah, uh, both men. No, it, it is not limiting the democratic authority, it is expanding the demo democratic authority instead if the you know, really participate. But having said that, like involvement, involvement can be different. Like Charles can play the role of constructive advisor, advising the church, the state and ruling authority to do or not to do certain things. Good advisory role. Then, Lars also can take up some measures so that good administration can be set up by the role of MPF now. Other than that, some ordained ministers they directly participated in contest election and participate in active politics. So uh, the question with the question we want to focus maybe the third one. I mean, so. so even if if ordained minister or ordained pastor feels that he has to serve society and contest it, then whether his success or not success depends upon acceptability of people. People accept him or not. A pastor may be accepted as a good pastor by the church members. But when he enters politics, will that same pastor, will, same, will that same pastor who is regarded by the church member as good pastor will be accepted as good politicians? That's why it depends upon the situation. So uh, I think it does not limit. It widens the democratic process. But in that widening democratic process, the one who is capable and the one who influence, the one who can who can influence and the one who can promote the expectation of the people may survive. Because politics is a survivor game, a game for survival. Okay, next question we have from Ms. C. Vanarwati. Uh, when do the charge, when do the charge state dichotomy has increased in Mizoram? Uh, this charge state dichotomy actually it is not in Mizoram, starting from the birth of Christianity. So, church and state grow with this dichotomy. And in Mizoram, like, there are no much critical issues between church and state. Even when some issues are there, those issues are negotiated and are settled well. 
but there are just few one two issue which could not be negotiated which could not be solved and which broke out openly that also only one issue issue of you in 2008 and i mean 1988 then in 2018 so it repeated after 20 years that's why in this regard also earlier also the government and the chairs negotiated but final negotiation could not be reached then the same again and after that so chairs spoke about the evil of jew then on the other hand political leaders they reacted and some even went to the extent of openly criticizing church leaders in press briefings some politicians up to that extent came that's why other than this issue of jew dichotomy problem does not arise much but having said that dichotomy problem does not arise much in that critical evaluation i mentioned it like if government property government vehicle government resources are regarded as the right of the charge to be used if we have that notion i think that should also be changed that's why as far as practicable charge should also respect government property government things government resources likewise still also should respect the sanctity and spirituality of the church. And like, for example, sometimes uh, both the church and state can be blamed for uh, lack of maintenance of balance and dichotomy. For example, as I mentioned in that critical evaluation, if some church Minister District Council อันนี้ลงซองอ่ะโคเวลมีว่าตีลาลตุมรุตกะมอว่ามันตรังกายตุมรุตกะมออาเฮียนโกรนอันนี้นะคะคุยสนิทอมทรีนะคลายปอกค
through its offering? If so, what accordingly do you can this affect the political environment of Mizo society? Uh, I don't think it may be to that extent. Like, there are many successful businessmen or there are many successful persons who pay their tithe regularly and sometimes issue may be created out of that. But uh, I don't believe that some local charges or some chairs may be remote control or manipulated by those who contribute a lot in the of uh, yeah, there may be many issues, but if it is going to be proved, I don't think there may be valid proof at all. The such type of things may be in, uh, may be propagated by WhatsApp columnists, WhatsApp journalists, mm, uh, WhatsApp deliberators, and all. Social media. Okay, here we have come to the last question. Uh, it says, Sir, what do you think a secular state should look like seeing entang entanglement of religion and politics across India? Is there any scope for the right wing political parties to come to power in Mizoram, a Christian majority state? If not, how do we draw a balanced dichotomy of religion and politics? Uh, right wing political party is opening its base in the state of Indonesia, but not in this one. I don't think right wing political party will really open its account in this one. In the 2018 uh, legislative assembly election, I was engaged by the Northeast Life Center. I, I was here many a times in live discussion. And in most of the discussion, it was we may have its account, then uh, BJP may be in the government, and BJP influence is expanding those and that. But Whenever such points are raised, I used to say that there is no BJP influence, there is no Hindutva influence, there is no RSS influence in Mizoram. Of course, there are some faithful BJP workers. Faithful BJP workers are good things. And like in 2018 situation, uh, in every discussion, this was mentioned, and I say, like, uh, due to internal struggle and internal differences within the Congress party, some Congress, Congress and Malay, they defeated the Bizarre They with their members. That's why, due to that, BJP may have the chance either one or MLS seat. But winning that two MLS seat in Mizoram by BJP does not mean that BJP influence is very strong. No. But those Congress MLA and Congress workers they change their side to BJP. It is not due to Hindu Dwa influence, it is not due to BJP influence, or it is not due to BJP message. It is only Chains of sight by some politician along with their uh, followers. That's all. That led to the election of one BJP MLA from Chongte. But having said that, BJP has already opened its account and driving party may grow. Uh, that may be uh, a foul dream. That's why in this context, so far as the ideology 
motivation or so to say the Hindutva agenda and all, if you, you take all these things into account, it is unlikely that right wing party may come up in Mizoram in the near future. Okay, once again, sir, thank you so much for actively interacting with us and sharing your valuable knowledge and clarifying, clarifying our doubts. Uh, here is a gentle reminder for all the participants to kindly fill up the feedback form, the feedback link, which is uh, put in the chat box. So may I now call upon Dr. Zarzo Sanga, the coordinator of the webinar, to deliver a vote of thanks. Sir, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sansangi. I'll only take a brief moment of your time. And I'll supplement, I'll substantiate what Dr. Sansangi just announced. Uh, regarding the feedback form and the sessions attendance, uh, to get the certificate of this webinar, as we have already mentioned and announced in the previous nights, attending at least three out of the five technical sessions and the submission of the feedback form is mandatory. So please, uh, as uh, our host just announced, uh, please fill up the feedback form and submit it accordingly. And we will try to send you your certificate as soon as possible. Okay, uh, proceeding to the, vote of, uh, to the vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank our, respect, our respected principal for allowing us to organize this webinar and also for granting us the necessary funds for this webinar. It is his consent and permission that enabled us to organize this webinar in the first place. And secondly, my sincere thanks goes to our respected and esteemed resource persons who have consented to our humble request to be the resource persons for this webinar, uh, Professor Dongil and uh, Dr. Shiam Kishor, Sir SK, both of whom are my beloved teachers, Reverend R.C. Zongte and Reverend Dr. Ket Hanzawa. Uh, whom uh, the, I think uh, they are not with us here tonight because of some uh, other commitments. I personally thank you all, sirs, that you share your intellectual and academic expertise with us in this webinar. And I know that you have numerous commitments, various commitments, family commitments, academic and other professional commitments. So I thank you on behalf of the organizing team as well as on, on behalf of the participants as well as on our college's behalf for your valuable time. And thirdly, I would also like to extend my thanks to my colleagues in the Department of Political Science Government Sensei College for their constant support and enthusiasm for this webinar. And especially, I would like to mention that our prayers are with our head of department, Puh Zonun Tuanga, who is currently undergoing cancer treatment at ISOL, yet giving us constant support and uh, constant moral and material support to organize this webinar. So, sir, we wish you a speedy recovery. And also, thanks to all our colleagues from various departments in this college, all from arts, science, and the BCA departments, uh, who have lent us a helping hand, and many of whom have participated since the start of this webinar till the end tonight. So I, I would like to thank all my colleagues in our college from various departments across various streams. Even our host for tonight, Dr. Kael Hingsangi, is not from the Department of Political Science. She is from the Department of Botany. This kind of cooperation is the reason why the Department of Political Science is able to organize this international webinar. So thanks to our colleagues. And thirdly, my deepest appreciation goes to the webinar committee of our college, uh, the technical minds behind all the webinars that we have organized that the various departments of the college has organized during this lockdown period, including this webinar. And among them, I would like to name out, I'd like to call out the names of some of the members of the committee. Particularly, I would like to give special thanks to Sir David, Sardin Puy and uh, Dr. Artia, whom I have disturbed countless times during the build up to this webinar and even during the course of this webinar for their uh, in, for their technical expertise. So without them, this online webinar would not have been a reality. And lastly, but not the least, my heartfelt thanks goes to all our dear participants who have participated and attended each and every session since the beginning of the webinar program Monday night. And 
many of the participants who are still with us here till the end of the lecture, till the end of the webinar program, and also participated in a lively and mind-opening discussion throughout all the sessions. So without each and every one of you, this program would and could not have been a success. So thanks to you all. And for that, I would like to uh, thank our uh, resource persons, our hosts, our technical hosts, our uh, webinar committee, as well as our uh, dear participants again for making this webinar program a complete success. Thank you. And back to you, Dr. Samsangi. Thank you, Sazara. So with that, we have come to the end of our one-week international webinar. Once again, our sincere and heartfelt gratitude for all the participants for active participation and being uh, with us all through the program. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.